Proverbs 16, verses 18 and 19 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better is it to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So what is a haughty spirit? It's pride. That's what it means. Go next to Proverbs 18, verse 12 and 13. It says here, Before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Did you know that haughty, prideful people will always do that? They will answer a matter before they hear it. You say, you know, I just want to show you the thing about the Bible prophecy. Oh, yeah, yeah, you don't, you don't even need to go there. I've, I understand Bible prophecy. I've studied it myself for many years. You know, okay, I have my own opinions. You have your opinions. Let's just come to, you know, agree to disagree. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, you know, let me tell you about this thing. This, this, this is really good for your health. Oh, yeah, I've, I, I know all about that. I know all about it. I don't even need to hear it. You know, don't, don't even talk to me about it. What is it? That's a haughty spirit. Have you ever run into somebody with a haughty spirit? A few. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 24. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 24 says here, Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. Hmm. Another very interesting verse there. Uh, and it's, it's kind of funny there, you know, the thing about, you know, proud wrath, you know, um, a lot of times you feel, you know, if somebody's wronged you or whatever else, you know, you kind of feel sometimes like I want to get revenge on that person because they've hurt my pride, my ego. Don't do that. Okay. Um, pride oftentimes will beget pride. They will say, they will answer the matter before they hear it and it actually makes you mad, and then you, a lot of times, respond back to them with a haughty spirit yourself. Uh, you don't have a responsibility to convert everybody and, and to set everybody straight, okay? If they don't want to hear it, walk away. Best thing that you can do. Next, go to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah 3, verse 16. We'll begin reading here. It says here, Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walked with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tingling, tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments, about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and, apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of a sweet, instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent, Instead of well set hair, baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty, the men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she, being desolate, shall sit upon the ground. You know, that's going to be the future of all the uh, prideful and haughty women here in America? All of them. If not before the rapture, definitely after the rapture in the time of Jacob's trouble. America is not going to last. America is going to get hit hard with God's judgment. It already is. You know, and you'll see these women and they were once very prideful and haughty. And I own a beautiful mansion out in the mountains of Washington State or California or Colorado or something. And some forest fire comes through, wipes out their mansion and you see them there and they're clothes have charcoal on them and their faces are blackened from the soot and everything else and they're they're crying and they're sitting on the ground I lost my home I lost everything sweaty smelly lost it all but they sure were haughty before then mm -hmm. so if you're a, a Christian woman and you're having some of these uh, 
women putting you down and things like that, you know, that are dressed uh, very, very well to do, you know, and all this stuff like that, uh, you're going to have the last laugh. Don't let it bother you. Next, go to Isaiah chapter 24, verse 4. Okay, it says here, The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do languish. Prideful, haughty people are going to come to absolutely nothing. Don't worry about them. Okay, don't fear them. It'll bring you into a snare. These haughty people, the prideful people, their day is coming. All right, next we're going to go to number seven, the hasty spirit. Proverbs 14. Yeah, Proverbs 14, verse 29. Proverbs eight, uh, 14, verse 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Hmm. They exalt folly because they're hasty of spirit. We're going to see a little bit more about this. Ecclesiastes 7, verses 8 and 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8 says here, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Remember, like we just read about there, the haughty spirit. Verse 9, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Hmm. That's also very interesting. Kind of goes, you know, see these spirits, they all tie in with each other. They'll, you know, you'll get somebody that's, oh, I don't really want to, you know, they're, they're kind of like a, a spirit of slumber. You'll get the deaf and dumb spirit. You'll get the lying spirit. You'll get all these different spirits, the haughty spirit. You'll also get it tying in with the hasty spirit. You try to witness to somebody, you get about three words out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you know. Don't even go there. I don't even want to hear it. You know, and they start getting mad right away. And you haven't even tried to offend them yet. You're just trying to share the gospel with them and they get mad right away. See, there's all these spirits. They just like intertwine with each other. Okay. And you should be patient in spirit, by the way, and not proud in spirit. That's important. Next, we're going to look at the spirit of heaviness. Go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, there you see it, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Okay, what's going on there? Well, they're going through judgment and things like this. And, you know, he's basically saying, you know, I can give you these things and you can rejoice and you can have their, it says, the, uh, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So you see that thing there. What is the spirit of heaviness? Well, we're going to look at this now. Job chapter 9. You want to find a man in the... Bible that had reason to be heavy in his spirit, Job was certainly the man there. We're going to see that. Job chapter 9, verse 25. Job 9, verse 25 says, Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. They see no good. They are passed away as the swift ships, as the eagle that hasteth to the prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid of all my sorrows. 
I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet thou plunge me in the ditch and mine own clothes shall abhor me. <laughs> That's pretty bad when your own clothes abhor you. you know. But you see there in verse 27, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. Job was, excuse me, Job was depressed. All right. He was very heavy. He had a spirit of heaviness. Depression, in other words. Next, we're going to go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, verse 19 and 20. Psalm 69, verse 19. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Now, is it wrong when you have a spirit of heaviness to look for somebody to pity you and somebody to comfort you? No. But you have to be careful with that because when you're in a, a state of depression, a state of a, when a spirit of heaviness is upon you, it can lead to self-pity. When you don't find anybody that really understands and doesn't want to listen to what you're going through, you can start to pity yourself. That's where it gets dangerous. That's where you have to be careful. So definitely watch out for that. Next go to Psalm 119, verse 28. The biggest uh, chapter, so to speak, it's actually a psalm, but the biggest one in the Bible is about the Word of God. Interesting. Psalm 119, verse 28 says, My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Oh boy. <laughs> you know what one of the best ways to get out of depression is? Reading the Bible. You get strengthened by reading the Word of God. But you know what one of the most difficult things to do is when you are depressed, when you have that spirit, spirit of heaviness upon you? Reading the Word of God is very, very difficult when you're going through depression. You're just like, I don't want to do anything. I just, I just want to sit here and just, oh, I feel so bad. I, I'm just down. And, and you're going through this depression time. And you get a lost person that's in depression. A lot of times they don't want to hear the Word of God either. You know? But you say, then it's always a sin to be depressed and sad and everything. It's a spirit of oppression, or a spirit of, uh, not oppression, a spirit of heaviness, excuse me. Um, you know, it's just a horrible thing and you should never be depressed. It's not what the Bible teaches. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 4, speaking prophetically of Jesus Christ, what he went through here on the earth, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Jesus Christ went through some sorrow himself. Now, was it because he had an evil spirit upon him? No. It's just living down here, you're going to be have some sorrow. Okay? That's totally fine. But when you just when you get under the spirit of heaviness and you can't come out of the sorrow thing and it's just there all the time and you just can't get any victory over it, uh, you're starting to deal with the spirit realm at that point in time. And you need to get in the Word of God. Turn next to Romans chapter 9. I showed you there that Jesus Christ had a problem with the sorrow. It wasn't really a problem. It's just he understood what was going on. I can imagine it would have been quite depressing to come down here and see your creation acting the way it does. So, but let's see about the uh, world's, or the greatest Christian of all time. Romans chapter 9 verse 1 says here, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, 
that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why did Paul have that? Let's continue. Verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. How do you explain that if you're into replacement theology? It's a problem. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Hmm. Very interesting there. Paul had continual sorrow because he had a great burden for the Jewish people, for the nation of Israel. Okay? Was that a sin? No, it wasn't. And see, there's a difference between sorrow and heaviness. A spirit of heaviness is when you are just down and you can't get out of the thing and you're just depressed. and It's not quite the same thing as sorrow. You know, but... Uh, you say, well, then it's okay just to be sorrow and sorry and just kind of sad and kind of melancholy and whatever else. Well, you have to be careful of that, too. Second Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to show you that, you know, there is a danger. I mean, you, you know, you should be honest with people, but there is a danger in just being down a lot. You know, and, and having sorrow, but then it leads into the spirit of heaviness. There's a danger there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? So Paul is saying, you know, it had gone from just sorrow to now a spirit of heaviness with Paul, and he's just going around, and he's just so depressed, and oh man, and they come in there like, Hey, brother Paul, how you doing? Well, I've been better. I'm just really feeling down right now. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Paul. I didn't, oh, well, you know, things are just really going bad. and uh, You know, you be careful with some of that stuff, you know. I mean, it's okay to get sorrowful and, and things and, and to be upset about stuff. I mean, sure. But just don't let your heaviness start to hurt the brethren. That's important to remember. First Peter chapter 1. Go over there next. First Peter chapter one, verse five through seven it says here, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, I think doctrinally it's pointed to somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble, but there's also some you know, instruction in righteousness for us today as Christians. You are going to be in manifold temptations, and it's going to lead to heaviness sometimes. It's just one of them things that you're going to have to get through. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, uh, okay, finally, for, we're there finally. A lot of scriptures to go through. But uh, the spirit of Jezebel. What about the spirit of Jezebel? Well, we're going to look at the scriptures on this. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2, verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 through 23. Okay, it says here, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Now, here we go, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth, her, calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Um, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. 
and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Okay? Now, you say, well, uh, so there, there's this woman Jezebel, right? Well, it can't be referring to the woman in the Old Testament because she died in the Old Testament. We're going to see about that here, and we're going to read the story here. So it can't be re referring to that woman back there. You say, well, then there must have been another woman there in the first century that they were writing about, Jezebel. No, because she's not going to be controlling all the different churches back there. See, that's why a lot of people take this to be a spirit of Jezebel. Okay? And it's kind of true, but, you know, there's some issues with that and things because I believe that this woman Jezebel is a reference to Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, the Roman Catholic Church, the mother church, you know, that they call it. We're going to see about that. Keep your hand here in Revelation chapter uh, 2 and go back to Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 is where we're going to start reading. Okay, it says here, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What does it say here about Jezebel? To teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Does the Roman Catholic Church have idols? Mm -hmm. And what is the heart, the very heart of their worship service is what? Eating things. The Mass. Hmm. Okay, and I gave her this space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Verse 21 there in Revelation chapter 2. Um, did, has God allowed the Roman Catholic system to go on for a while? Did he give her space to repent of her fornication? Yeah. Almost 2,000 years. A lot longer than that if you want to go back to the underpinnings, the, the early roots of Mystery Babylon, you know, the Babylonian system. Hmm, interesting. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So you see that thing there, and you compare that woman to this woman Jezebel over here in Revelation chapter 2. It's talking about the same thing, talking about that same system, the system of Roman Catholicism. I have a whole study on Mystery Babylon. What is it? Okay, but is there a spirit that goes along with Roman Catholicism? Yeah, she is actually a woman, the mother church. Yeah, that's actually there, but I believe that there's a spirit, a feministic spirit that goes along with Roman Catholicism. And this feministic spirit will oftentimes infest women that are part of that system. They will become very domineering, very controlling of their husbands, and as a result, they manifest this Jezebel spirit. Okay, we're going to see about this. I mean, why would the Lord use the term Jezebel, the word Jezebel, for Roman Catholicism? Let's look about the real Jezebel. Turn your Bible back to 1 Kings chapter 16. First Kings chapter 16, verse 30. Okay. It says here, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as, it, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, 
the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him, just like a modern Catholic does today. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. The Roman Catholics also have groves. They put their idols of Mary, the Queen of Heaven, you know, and you can see my study on that too. You know, they put her in this grove, you know, they set up their idol in the grove. Roman Catholicism is just the ancient system of Baal worship, is all the thing is. Very important to understand that. But you see, you see there that this king in Israel marries a woman named, excuse me, named Jezebel. Interesting, too, because if you are a Roman Catholic, you are essentially married to Mystery Babylon. Hmm. Interesting. Next, go to 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, the king there that had married uh, Jezebel. And I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. And there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Jezebel actually was killing the prophets of God. Hmm. Just like uh, Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon. You see the tie-ins there? Why would God call Roman Catholicism Jezebel? Because the ancient Jezebel, the real Jezebel there, the, the one that was actually a woman named Jezebel, she was killing God's prophets. You go to Revelation chapter 17, she's guilty of the blood of the martyrs and saints of Jesus. See, it ties together there. Now, of course, we're not going to read all the story here, but you know, you can go down to uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 here. And it says here, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. <laughs> I like that too. You know, Ahab, the king, comes and he goes, you're the one that's making all this trouble, you Bible-believing, Bible-thumper, divisive, you know, whatever, like they do to us today. And uh, Elijah answers back and he says, I'm not the one that's troubling Israel. You are. But continuing here, it says in verse 18, In that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. Like all the you know Catholic priests and cardinals and bishops and stuff. Get them all together. Verse 20, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. I like that too, you know. How long halt ye between two opinions? If Jesus Christ is the Lord, if he is God, then you worship him. If Mary is the queen of heaven and God and whatever, then you worship her. You can't have both. Either Jesus Christ died on the cross and that's sufficient for your salvation, and you don't need anybody else. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Or you got Mary interceding for you. You know, and the blood comes out of the side of Jesus and it goes through Mary's hands and all this other stuff. See? They're halting between two opinions. Very interesting. Now jump down to verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, to Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. And you know, I get a little bit tired sometimes of people that say, well, you shouldn't make fun of Catholicism, Brian. You should show them love and you should show... You, as a Christian, you have no responsibility to show respect and honor to a satanic cult 
that is damning people to hell. Okay? Remember that. You, do not, you are not obliged to show respect to Catholic priests. Just like Elijah was doing here to these priests of Baal, no respect. We don't have to give them respect either. Don't fall for that thing. But uh, next we're going to go to 1 Kings 18, verse 40. And of course, you can read the whole story here. We're trying to skip ahead for sake of time. But it says here, you know, of course, the priests of Baal try to have their sacrifice and, and they are calling on Baal to light the altar up and burn the altar and uh, or light their sacrifice. It doesn't work. And Elijah has God do it and fire comes down from heaven and just devours the whole thing. And here's what Elijah does, you know, to show his love and tolerance for the wonderful priests of Baal and the fact that he respects them and has appreciation and ecumenical dialogue. And here's what he does. Verse 40, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. He killed the priests? Mm -hmm. You say, oh, are we supposed to do that today? No, we're not supposed to physically kill them, but you can sure spiritually kill them with the sword of the Spirit, King James Bible. But uh, as far as the physical killing, that's God's job. He's going to take care of that real soon. So don't do that. But let's look at uh, Jezebel's reaction to this. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. You know, like a little little child goes back and tells his wife what, what the bad, you know, uh, prophet there did, you know. And withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I might make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So Elijah ran away. Okay. Uh, shouldn't have done that. Should have stayed and stood his ground against that woman. But uh, that woman can be very persuasive sometimes, and she can scare you as a Christian. But let's go to 1 Kings chapter 21. Okay. First Kings chapter 21, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. And by the way, Elijah does get away from her and everything. You can read the story. Let's continue here. Um, Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it uh, me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would not eat bread. And would eat no bread. Ahab was a little crybaby, in other words. And you'll see this thing. You'll see a husband of a woman that is a Jezebel spirit. The husband is always going to be meek and kind of pouty and he doesn't get his way. And mm, You'll see that. Verse, verse 5. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. <laughs> Having a little pity party. Verse 7, And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Wait a second. She just said, Aren't you the king here? Yeah, he was the king. Then she should have said, Take it like a man. 
you know, whatever. Honey, don't don't be upset about this. Whatever, you know, you're the king, you know. Whatever. She said, hey, you're the king. Now I'm going to control you, is what she said. Spirit of Jezebel. Verse 8, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name. What not Ahab that did it. It was her. And sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote letters she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And they had lying spirits, in other words. And uh, sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Hmm. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, which is in Samaria, behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha the son of Ahijah. For the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. Now look what happens here to Jezebel. Verse 23, And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Hmm. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Isn't that interesting? You say, what's significant about that? Well, Revelation chapter 18, you read about the destruction of Mystery Babylon. She's destroyed. And the people stand afar off, weeping and wailing for the destruction of her. Hmm. And it says there, Him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Doesn't it say over there in Revelation chapter 19 about the Antichrist army that comes out? And the Lord comes down and wipes them out. And then the fowls come down and eat them out there in the field. Hmm. Interesting. Verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. She was the one that caused him to do this. I mean, you know, he asked a guy, I mean, it was a good business deal. You know, he just, hey, could you sell me your, your vineyard there and everything? No. You know, Naboth says no. Well, that should have been the end of it. You know? I mean, if, if Ahab would have gone home and, and you know, he's pouting and everything else, he'd have gotten over it eventually. But his wicked wife came in and caused him to do something very stupid. She caused him to sin. Verse 26, And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard these words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and wept and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? 
because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. And of course, Jezebel does die. She dies. She's eaten by the dogs. But Ahab, after she died, that spirit there, that spirit of Jezebel was no longer controlling him. And now he was able to come and fall down, fall down before God and say, I'm sorry. And he truly repented because Jezebel was now out of the picture. And you know, I've seen that thing. I've seen some men that are just totally controlled by a wife and that Jezebel spirit that's in that woman. And they're almost always Catholic. You know, they're part of that whole system. And they control their husband and control him and control him and control him. And many times they die and that husband changes. Hmm. So that's going to be it for this study. Uh, went kind of long there, but uh, there's a lot of scriptures to go through. And, and uh, boy, you talk about uh, spiritual attacks going through this one. Um, all kinds of noises. This is like my third time recording this sermon and uh, just incredible. Uh, when you start to talk about the spirit realm, things start going haywire. And, uh, you know, I had to get, get this thing out because there's a lot of people out there that, that just, you know, we all see these spirits being manifested in people. And, you know, we all have to fight these spirits off ourselves. Uh, you can you know, fall prey to a spirit of slumber. You can kind of start to fall asleep, you know, and, and uh, become unfruitful for the Lord. You can fall prey to lying spirits. You can start to hear the wrong kind of preaching, the wrong kind of teaching, and start to fall prey for that. Uh, deaf and a dumb spirit. You know, sometimes we don't want to hear the word of the Lord and we don't want to speak it. Spirit of fear, how about that one? Sometimes you can start to hear some of this conspiracy stuff. And I'll grant you, some of it's true. Some of it, you know, is, is there. And, and there are some very fearful things that are coming. But uh, God's not given us that spirit of fear. You can understand that things are bad, but don't be afraid. Don't get your eyes removed from Jesus Christ. Remember that God is your Father and that He can protect you. Um, how about the seducing spirit? That can certainly be there. You can start to lose your common sense because you hear all these seducing spirits telling you that medical studies have said such and such and this has said such and such and they get you to turn against the Word of God. Be careful of that. How about a haughty spirit? You know, it's very easy to get prideful sometimes when you have a lot of possessions and things are going very well and things like that. You start to get kind of haughty. Be careful about that. How about a hasty spirit? You know, are you just so busy that you don't have time to uh, stop and smell the roses, as they say? Be careful about the hasty spirit. How about a spirit of heaviness? Mm-hmm. I know a lot of us go through that. I've gone through it many, many times. I'll have a spirit of heaviness. The sorrow will turn into heaviness. You know, and there are some times I get so depressed when I'm trying to put together a message and I'm just like... Oh boy, I just, man, I just can't bring myself to get this thing done. Uh. And for you ladies out there, be careful about the Jezebel spirit. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, the thing that Satan fears the most in this world is not a saved man. You say, what are you talking about? God doesn't fear preachers the most? No. Um... The thing that God fears the most in this world is a saved woman that is married to a saved man. What are you talking about? Uh, how did sin come into the world? Through Eve? The woman being in the transgression fell? See? Satan goes after the saved woman more than anybody else. She's the weaker vessel. You get a lion. You know, the Bible like, says that Satan's like a roaring lion. A lion will run after the weak one in the, prey, in, the, in the herd. He'll prey on the weak. The woman is more sensitive. She's more caring, more uh, not as quick to want to wanna judge things and, and attack things and whatever else. She's very sensitive. 
the devil will try to get you. If you're a woman, he will try to get, infect you with that Jezebel spirit. And all of a sudden, you're going to start looking at your husband and saying, that big dumb animal, he's a stupid, he's just a man. His men are this way, and that's just the way a man is. And Oh boy, you better be careful of that stuff. You know what your job is as a woman, a Christian woman? It's to build up your house, not to tear it down. And when you see your husband falling and having problems, you say to yourself and to the Lord, you say, Okay, Lord, please show me from your word how I can help my husband, how I can build my husband up, how I can be a helpmate to him. Your job is not to put your husband down. Your job is to lift him up. And that doesn't mean if he does wrong that you praise him for it. No. When your husband does wrong, you need to think of constructive ways to say, Honey, doesn't the Bible say? Seek to build up that home. That's very important. Very extremely important. Okay? And this Jezebel spirit thing, I've seen it manifested many, 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 many times with women out there in the world and things. I've seen that thing. And it's a temptation. And, and again, you know, you get women, you know, if you're a Christian lady and you, you're around a woman that's very controlling and domineering of her husband and you see that thing... And she does the thing, you know, I'll just give you a little bit of a thing here with this, this uh, Jezebel spirit, because I've seen this thing manifested. They will fake cry. Okay? You say, what are you talking about? You know, I can't believe you said that to me. Oh, I just can't believe it. Oh, you know, and stuff. And you, you touch me and say, you're hurting me. Stop. Don't hurt me. That's what they'll do. They'll put on their little show to get control of the situation. <laughs> They're not actually sorry. They're not actually sad. You know, we went through that with uh, my in-laws when they were here. It was a big crying fit and everything else. Oh, everything's bad. And we're leaving. Oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe we're treated this way. And, uh, and I'm like, you're the one that cussed in my house. And I said, don't do that. I didn't even kick them out. But the Jezebel spirit had to show up to try and make me look bad, you know. And my father-in-law is very much an Ahab, if you know what I mean. Controlled. And I've seen that thing. I've seen, I've, I have relatives that are that way, where the husband is Ahab and the wife is Jezebel. And it's just like, you know, she controls the situation. Where's the pants in the family, as they say? That isn't right. And if you're a Christian and you feel that, a Christian lady, and you feel that, that kind of a thing there and you know that you can kind of put on the tears, you know, to get your way and stuff. That is the Jezebel spirit. You better fight that thing because God can't bless you when you have that. When you're doing that, when you're trying to control your husband, boy, bad situation. You know, and I, I kind of, I was thinking maybe I should just do a whole sermon just on the Jezebel spirit thing. But, you know, there's, there's just like this ever-increasing list of sermon requests that I need to do. And so many of them are so good. I don't know of any other sermons to point people to them and stuff like that. Um, some of it I just have to say, I, no, I can't. You know, it's just like it's going to take too much time to study it. And we don't have that much time left, you know, here and things on earth. So just like I can't spend the kind of time to study this thing and whatever. Other ones, I have done the study. I need to put the research together, put things down on paper. You know, it's just a matter of trying to get this stuff done. So the Jezebel spirit, I thought, well, I'm just going to put it right in here with this these nine spirits of evil. Um, because I think a lot of times we, we just, you'll get through a situation, you know, witnessing to somebody and you're just like, how did it turn out like that? I don't, man, what on earth happened? Well, there's a spirit there. There are spirits there. You know, and it's getting rough out there on the battlefield, brethren. I mean, it's getting real rough. So, I uh, wanted to put that study together. Like I said, it's just been, this has been a rough one in this video here. I wanted to get out, you know, I was going to do it outdoors. It would probably have been better there, but um, just there's too many things going on right now here. Uh, a lot of work and things. Um so I didn't get out there, but man, distractions today. Ugh. I mean, it just kind of reminds me. I don't know if you could hear it in the video, but there was a, 
a, a dump truck that just was backing in here, you know, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> and it's just like this one time I remember we were out door to door and we were witnessing to this guy and, um, and it was actually a former classmate of the guy I was witnessing with. They'd gone to high school together and, um, this brother was, was talking to him and he was like, yeah, he's like, you remember how I was in high school? He's like, I was a wicked man. I was a wicked boy back then. You know, I was a wicked guy. And he's like, you know, the Lord saved me. And this guy was really getting under conviction. And, and you know, we were like talking to him and stuff. And, and, and uh, the brother that was with me, he was like, you know, would you want a King James Bible if we get you one? And he was like, yeah, I'd like to, to get a Bible and I'd like to read it. He's like, I, I would. I'm actually very interested in this. He said, I'm, I'm actually worried about my soul. And just like that, boom. This car pulls up, not 10 feet away from us. I mean, we're like right in town, you know, and so you got the curb or you got the walk, you know, the sidewalk and then your curb and then the street. This car pulls up right behind us, rap music blaring and boom, 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 boom like this. And the guys are dealing drugs in the car right behind us. And just the, the whole conviction and everything just went boom right away. So what was that all about? Spirits were at work. We are in a battlefield, brethren. Don't forget that. This down here is a war. You're in a war zone. There's no uh, safe zone. I don't care where you go. It's still, you know, the devil is the god of this world at this point in time. God is in control. Yes, I understand that. But he allows the devil to get away with things right now. Okay. This is a war zone. So be careful when you see these different spirits out there. Remember that there are spirits that are mentioned in the Bible and that the only way you can really def defeat them is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I think I have that mentioned or quoted right it's in first or second corinthians i forget now but uh the point is here's your offensive weapon in ephesians chapter 6 talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood remember the pieces of armor remember we are at war and remember that there are spirits out there that are evil and that those spirits are going to try and deceive you and try and mess you up mess up your life so, that's going to be it for this study, and uh, I'm sorry it went a little bit long. I'm just really having a hard time focusing my mind right now. It's just, <laughs> uh, it's really something. Uh, please keep us in your prayers. We do really appreciate that, everybody praying out there for us. And uh, I guess that's going to be it for this study. So, thank you very much for watching. Um, Next week, I'm not sure yet, might be doing the study on the Sabbath. Uh, I, I am going to be doing um, some more work on the house church thing here. I'm reading a book right now by David Cloud on the house church movement. And I'm going to be refuting his book uh, with the video. And uh, a lot of different projects coming up here. So uh, I'll definitely keep everybody posted what's what all is going on. And... Um, I think that's it. I'm going to be doing a study too coming up just to give everybody a heads up here. I want to do an evangelistic study or a evangelistic sermon, so to speak, uh, for atheists out there because I think that the atheists are very much deceived. Uh, they are. I mean, they're foolish according to the Bible. And I want to do a evangelistic message for atheism. It's going to be called Three Logical Fallacies of Atheism. So I'm going to be putting that thing together and, you know, I'm going to be kind of blunt with them and things because I want to be honest with people. So uh, that's going to be coming up. Not sure when that's going to be done, but uh, that's another one that's on the uh, back burner, so to speak, but coming. So that's going to be it. I'm going to close here with a word of prayer, and then that'll be it. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, so much for your word, so much for the truth that your word contains that we can be warned about evil spirits and things and 
Lord, I just pray that you'd help all of us out there to fight, help all those saved children of yours to be able to fight against the wiles of the devil and just to stay in the word, Lord. That's so important. And just be so careful what they watch on YouTube and so careful what they listen to and so careful the, the company that they keep. And uh, Lord, that they wouldn't be distracted by fear or by seducing spirits or, or doctrines of devils, that they would just hold on to their King James Bible, not let anybody take it out of their hands. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us each opportunities to witness for thee. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunities I had this, this past week to talk about you and, and to meet people and things. And, and I just really pray, Lord, for more contacts in the future for all of us and, and just the courage, Lord, to continue on until you take us out of here. And I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. That will be it. We will see you in next week's study.